Okay, welcome uh, everybody to today's webinar, which uh, we're looking at uh, net zero and UK uh, cropping review. Uh, we've got uh, a fantastic speaker uh, who's going to present on this topic, uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion shortly afterwards. I'm Jonathan Foote. I'm uh, Head of Environment here at AHDB, uh, and uh, we're here to support farmers and growers uh, on the journey towards net zero. Um, we uh, are well aware that here in the UK that you face you know, considerable challenges at the moment, both economically, but also with the, the journey towards net zero. We've got a lot of focus coming up next month in Glasgow, uh, where agriculture will be part of the discussions uh, and we want to be part of the solution uh, and help uh, the UK move towards net zero. Currently, UK agriculture contributes 10% of the overall carbon footprint, so uh, quite significant. So uh, this is all part of the uh, NFU's Countryside COP, uh, and these are the events that are leading up to that uh, uh, COP uh, week uh, in, in sort of Glasgow. So if I do a bit of housekeeping, uh, Harley, could you just put up the, the next slide, please? You will um, all be muted at the moment uh, and your cameras are off uh, and that will remain that way throughout the um, uh, webinar. We will run between 10 and 11 o'clock. If we finish a bit earlier, then uh, that is uh, uh, not, not an issue. We will um, record the webinar uh, and we will make this available to everybody who's registered for the webinar after the event. Uh, and again, that can be uh, forwarded on to sort of friends and colleagues who may also have an interest in the topic. We'll follow up with a, a survey just to sort of uh, see what you thought of the, the webinar and how we can improve it for the future. And um, there is a question box, which uh, is on the next slide. This is how you can ask questions. So put your questions in there throughout the presentation, uh, and then we will uh, ask those um, questions to the, the, the panel at the very end. You can see that there's an orange arrow that uh, you can click at the top if it's not you haven't got the panel out, and then that will pop the panel out to give you access to those questions. Um, you can also use that panel if you've got technical issues, maybe you can't hear us. Uh, we will then pick up on that and, and try and correct it as we go along. Um, and um, uh, as I said, you know, there's plenty of opportunity to ask questions at the end of the, the seminar. So on to our first speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Harley Stoddart. He is a senior uh, environmental scientist here at AHDB. Uh, and he and uh, his team have been uh, working with CHAP and the NFU to um, commission this piece of work. And he'll explain why it's so key for the industry. Thank you, over to you, Harley. Good morning, everybody. And um, yeah, great to um, uh, see you all here and uh, welcome to my living room. Um, I'm going to go through the presentation now, but I just, on, whilst we've got the screen up, I have to ask a question, just to emphasise, please do, make my day. I like questions, ask questions, okay? Um, so yes, I'm Harley Stoddart, I work at AHDB, and I lead on uh, agricultural footprinting uh, across all sectors, okay? Um, so that's a lot of carbon work, but we also look at um, other environmental impacts as well. Um, I've been here for about uh, 10 years, um, and it's, uh, it's very fruitful work um, at AHDB. I love it here. Um, so, going to go through this uh, net zero and cropping review. I'll start with, I just, I'm just going to put up a little bit of a slide just to remind everybody um, a little bit of where uh, emissions are coming across on farm. Okay, so, oops, I'm um, seeing too much of myself on screen now. Hang on, bear with me. Um, so we've got um, uh, nitrous oxide emissions from housing, from growing, uh, from nitrogen and fertilizer use. We've got methane emissions. Um, all these so far, not so relevant to um, our crops. But actually, you know, those fertilizer emissions, taking power of vehicles, um, etc. You know, they're all relevant. We're not seeing the slides time. move on, Harley. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, Maybe try turning your camera off just to see if that helps with the bandwidth. Um, thanks. No problem. Can you see the slide now? 
John. Stop yes, that's just come through. Yeah, that's just come through. Thank you. Okay, not a problem. Let's um, do that as well. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, you get the picture. We know where the emissions are coming from, and we know where carbon sequestration is, is going. You know, into ground um, and into the soil and into above ground, i.e., into trees and hedges and such like. Now, it's important to remember that for for this review, that carbon sequestration doesn't um, uh, doesn't count basically at the carbon footprint of the crops, but it does count at the um, the farm carbon balance level. So <clears throat> we're looking uh, just at the emissions associated with um, the production of the crops. And it's a really important piece of work to do because we need a baseline. We need to have some good idea of what sort of numbers are associated with the production of different crops. You know, consistency and confidence go hand in hand, it says here, you know. Um, and we're looking to produce a report that is clear, transparent, but also citable, you know, so that people can refer to it and, and have confidence in the numbers um, that we've got there. Okay. Um, as uh, John mentioned, the, uh, the work's been uh, funded and supported by ourselves at AHDB, but also CHAP um, and also the NFU. Okay. The report's not yet ready. It's, uh, you know, the final draft stage and we've got all the information in, um, but we're actually going to launch it in January. So today really is just a it's, a, it's a bit of a teaser, but also an opportunity um, to ask any and all the questions that um, uh, you'd like to ask as well. So to give you an idea of the, um, uh, the crops that we're covering, we can't cover everything. So your favorite um, uh, you know, glass house crop may not be included here, but we've tried to go for a good spread of the crops. So you've got the, um, uh, the broad acre, arable crops and potatoes and beans and we've got a variety of horticulture crops as well okay now unashamedly the next few slides are going to include quite a lot of tables and quite a lot of numbers these are these are uh, there for reference to give you an idea of the sort of work that we're doing but also i don't want you to take them as gospel they're not the final uh, results they're probably very close to the final results but I wouldn't want you to go away thinking uh, these numbers are uh, written in stone. Okay. So here's an example of um, some of the, the arable crops. And we've got quite a lot of information for barley and wheat and uh, oats and you know, even triticales in the mix there. You know, we've got the oilseed rape and maize and linseed and even some sugar beet as well. And for these crops, we've got quite a lot of uh, information. And again, to remind you, there's no new information going into this review. It's trying to collate the best of um, uh, reports and uh, scientific papers and all sorts of things that are out there into one place. Okay. Um, just to try and give it some color, literally, um, but also, you know, to give you an idea of for, um, you know, if you take all the arable crops together and average them out, this is the sort of proportions that you get from different parts of the production. Okay, so the seed is quite a little. Okay, fuel use quite significant at sixteen percent. Um, but the really big ones here, as you can see, are the manufacture of fertilizer, and then the use of the fertilizer. So that soil N two O direct and soil N two O indirect is essentially the use of the fertilizer. So 36% is uh, nitrous oxide coming from the use of fertilizers. 28% is coming from the manufacture of those fertilizers. And then the crop residues, all that straw, all sugar beet tops or whatever it is being returned to the ground also release uh, some CO2, but also some uh, nitrous oxide as well, okay? It's different for different crops. Those proportions will, will alter slightly, but not massively. Okay. And then just to show you that we've, uh, uh, you know, we've included um, some of the uh, peas and beans, and we've got some um, you know, figures for the UK, but we've also got some figures uh, from around the world as well for, for, as a part of a comparison. 
we've got some of the, uh, uh, the root crops, carrots and parsnips and onions and potatoes. And <clears throat> actually, just before I go on to this, it's important to, um, uh, to think about this, not as um, examples of how low you should be getting to, but how low the carbon footprint could be getting to, okay? Because in cropping, the weather makes such a difference. Unlike with, um, uh, you know, it's, the weather is less important to um, uh, livestock uh, carbon footprints, but it's significant in the cropping, okay? Um, but also things like uh, the, the soil type and soil temperature, um, but as well as um, what uh, what percentage moisture are you harvesting your uh, your wheat and your barley at? All these things make a significant difference um, to the figures. Okay, so it can be very very regionally specific. But within the review, we've also looked at the sort of the what if propositions. You know, where could we get to, and under what scenarios? You know, what? and um, here's a, just you know again draft table uh, of some of the fertilizer technologies. There's other things in the report as well, but I just thought that this would be um, slightly more interesting. You know, so we're looking at uh, not just practice, not just reduction of, of certain inputs, but also um, what's coming along, what's the state of readiness of it, and what's its likelihood, uh, you know, what's its potential to reduce emissions. And then there comes, you know, the things, what can we actually do now? Before these um, innovative and technological solutions are you know, coming through, what do we know already that will make a significant difference? Okay, so I've just thrown up some, um, some ideas here. They're not necessarily in the order of priority, um, you know, but they're all good, well understood practices that we know that will help uh, reduce the overall uh, carbon footprint for crop products. You know, so using cover crops, soil sampling and yield mapping. And if you're using manures, manure sampling as well, so you know what you've got. So you know what to displace out of the um, synthetic fertilizer. Precision variable rate application. This is an interesting one because um, it kind of assumes that, you're, that too much fertilizer is being used or that you can rationalize the amount of fertilizer that you're using on a, uh, an in-field scale. Okay. Um, but that's actually really dependent on the, the, the one or two below. You know, having that crop nutrient management plan and sticking to the plan, using only what you need, know that you need to use, and thereby only using, you know, only paying for what you know you need to use as well. So those sorts of two go hand in hand. Legumes in rotation as well. We know that they have um, uh, an impact with regards to, you know, locking up nitrogen for the following crop. And the last one on the list on the left there, using manures. Okay, we've seen quite a lot in the in the press recently about, um, uh, you know, the ban on autumn application. The manures aren't known for being great to throw to a standing crop, but you know, in the spring, where you can, where manures can be applied, can make a significant difference to displacing synthetic fertilizer. And where you can, depending on your soil type, your cropping, um, but also your kit, you know, consider reducing cultivation. You know, could you move to min-till or zero-till? Would that fit with your system? That's largely about reduction in fuel use. And so is the controlled traffic. You know, we know that uh, controlled traffic is, is fantastic for uh, ensuring crop coverage and not overlapping, not using more fertilizer, not using more pesticides than you need to, uh, but also about fuel efficiency as well. And then there's the efficiency of crop drying and storage. Okay. So one of the things that you can do at home anytime is review the horsepower per hectare and review the fuel use per hectare as well. I'd also add into that, review the total nitrogen fertilizer in per tonnage of output. It's a really, really good indicator and a close proxy for uh, the carbon footprint of the crop. Okay. 
And that's pretty much all we've got to go through um, today. Um, do look out for the report in January. Um, but now, what we're hoping to do is to give you um, an opportunity to ask us any questions you like about the review, about carbon footprints of crops, uh, and all the more. So, um, if everybody's ready and would like to join me back on screen. Thank you very much for that, Harley. Um, and if we if we can, you know, remove the the share screen, that'd be great. We can see everybody. We've got some questions coming in. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce our other panelists who will um, uh, also answer some of the questions that we've got. So uh, first up is Ali uh, Hasketh from uh, the NFU. She's the combinable crop uh, advisor. Uh, she supports NFU members uh, uh, across a range of policy issues that affect arable farmers. Um, and she works within the environment team uh, supporting on those key policy areas. Next up, we have uh, Harry uh, Langford. Um, he's the Innovation Network Lead at CHAP. Um, and um, he's there really very much to support with development uh, in terms of research and development, collaboration, and developing new innovation uh, sort of uh, programs and pathways, uh, and making sure that uh, we can get that out to sort of farmers uh, and growers. So welcome to the panelists, and um, uh, thank you very much for giving up your time today. So I've got one question before I move to the, um, uh, the, the questions that have come in, and please keep submitting questions as well. Um, and if we don't get through them all, we will also follow up after the, the webinar as well. So Harley, you mentioned in your presentation that um, net zero and carbon sequestration can't be uh, measured at the product level. Can you explain why this is, please? Because uh, many of us might be thinking, well, surely you can do that. Yeah, okay. Um, and actually, it's not an uncommon question I get with regards to, you know, what would my a particular crop have to yield in order for net zero. Um, in the UK, um, the UK is signed up to the Paris Accord and that means that we follow uh, a particular methodology that allows for the greatest comparison uh, between and across industries but also across nations and states as well. And within that, we don't count the sequestered carbon at a product, you know, so a ton of wheat level. Now, this is partly because it's difficult to attribute, um, you know, the amount of carbon sequestered by uh, hedgerows and, and woodlands, for example, at a ton of wheat level. And on a farm in East Anglia where there might not be much in the way of hedges or, or uh, woodlands versus somewhere uh, more woody, um, you know, you're going to get a, quite a, a difference. So the carbon footprint just looks at the emissions associated with the production of that crop. So we're not trying to get to zero, we're just trying to get it as low as it can be. Okay. And then at the farm level, you can take into account all those hedges and trees and other ways of soaking up carbon, such that um, you know, at a at a farm level, you can then look at the carbon balance. Brilliant, thank you for that. Ali, sort of following on from that sort of um carbon sort of question, how can farmers be empowered to measure and manage their carbon footprints? There are concerns um, about it at the moment, sorry. Yeah, of course. I mean, in terms of empowering and um, measuring your footprint, I know there's lots of different tools out there and ways that you can look at um, measuring your carbon footprint. But it's about, um, yeah, it's about getting the right tool that works for you and um, looking at um, your business and how your business functions um, and really starting off that process. I think, you know, making sure that we've got a baseline and, and an understanding of how to improve. Um, and the, the NFU is also there to be able to support farmers. We all know that everyone's got a different journey uh, and that it's an industry-wide ambition. But we're there to sort of to be able to enable policy and help farmers to make those steps after they've got the initial benchmark. I guess just to just to add to that, I think um, sort of yeah, as Harley mentioned uh, during the presentation, you know, defining your 
your sort of your own uh, your own baseline and trying to explore some of those proxy metrics that, uh, that Harley just mentioned. But then also, you know, talking to your peers and more broadly across the sector and actually having the conversations as well. And it's we've we also got to remember, even though um, and net zero carbon is is of uh, vital importance, that it we can't be too blinkered to that because there are a lot of other ecosystem services and obviously um, food production that, that is provided. Um, and so we need to make sure that we, we keep making a holistic assessment of uh, the challenges and, um, and try and deal with it um, in, in a holistic manner so that we can balance those trade-offs and, and avoid any potential unintended consequences. I, I fully support that. I think, you know, we shouldn't use net zero as a proxy for good environmental performance. And I think, you know, to add to Ali's uh, answer that, you know, farmers and growers should, you know, select the tool that suits them best, but also not chop and change because actually the variation between the tools will, you know, swamp what you're trying to do in terms of that baseline. So, you know, pick one tool, keep using it consistently. If it's not 100% right, that doesn't matter because actually what you'll then be comparing is the difference between years rather than the difference between tools. And as Harley said, you know, weather can make a huge variation. So you maybe need to have that in the back of the mind. So, you know, that that's, you know, you know, really good advice in terms of where farmers can move forwards. Um, what, Harry, what sort of accessible sort of technologies do you think there will be that will help you know, farmers to move on their journey towards net zero? Uh, well, I mean, there are, there are obviously a lot of technologies and I think Harley covered a few of the technologies and, and practice changes that, um, that can be utilised. So, I mean, I, I like to sort of think of it across four main sort of technology areas. So you've got your novel inputs. Um, so a lot of the biologicals, the um, biofertilizers, biostimulants, and and then your microbiome technologies, either enhancing it through um, practice change or through, through composting technologies or via amendment. Uh, and then you've got your sort of circular economy solutions. You've got your sort of waste to worth solutions because um, food waste is, uh, is around, I think, 3% of our of the UK's carbon footprint, so uh, you can begin to make um, make an, an impact by reducing food loss and waste, and converting that uh, waste into into a useful useful product. And then there's obviously the organic nutrient management that we've been alluding to, the manure management or digestate uh, management and technologies that can, uh, like the plasma, um, sort of the uh, technologies for enhancing digestate or, or manure, some of these technologies can help to uh, actually uh, improve the, the nutritive value of some of these products. And then you've got your prediction technologies. You've got sensing, sensing technologies across stress, health and disease, and that can really help you as a farmer or grower to be confident in not applying um, a crop protection product or confident to reduce um, inputs or, or to apply in a, in a variable uh, rate uh, manner. And then I think you've also got your automation technologies. So as we've alluded to, there's the precision technologies and the variable rate technologies, but then there's also the electric machinery and robotic technologies that uh, ultimately look to uh, replace fuel, um, reduce fuel uh, use or replace fuel use with, uh, with renewable um, electricity. So I think there's, a, there's really a myriad of, of technologies and, and some are at market and some are, are really sort of coming through, um, coming through the development uh, pipeline and, and will be you know, available uh, and used in, in, the, in the coming years. But those are broadly the sort of technology areas that are really going to make the difference. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And, and uh, you know, some exciting sort of technologies. Now, we've got some uh, sort of quite technical questions, uh, and these might uh, 
uh, go to Harley. So Harley, Tom Clark asks, what are the units for these uh, figures? So we didn't have those on the ta uh, on the tables. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so everything is measured in uh, well uh, kilos of CO2 equivalent per tonnage output. So um, I, you know where the um, um, arable ones were in the uh, the hundreds. That's kilos. Uh, sometimes you see them reported in uh, tons of CO2, uh, CO2 equivalent per ton of output. Um, but generally, these are, are in kilos of CO2 equivalent per tonne output. Yeah, thank you. And we've got another question from Alison Grundy, which is, does 36% of the nitrous oxide include the background emissions from the soil without fertilizer? It's a good question. So essentially, yes, it does. Um, it measured, So that's measuring all the emissions uh, from the crop. Um, or from the ground, if you like. So um, that includes the fertilizer being applied and whatever background there would be. Um, but in terms of um, uh, background that there would be, in an arable cropping situation with uh, not a whole lot of uh, organic matter breaking down, you're not going to see an awful lot of uh, nitrous oxide uh, being volatilized, but there will be some, and it does include in that. Thank you. And we've got one from David uh, Lith, which, um, uh, and we may have to come back on this one, I suspect, which is, does the fertilizer, you know, the net value for the fertilizer uh, include the value of CO2, which, as we know from the recent CO2 crisis, is a significant byproduct and therefore should be treated as an unconsumed supply or emission from the, 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 the production of fertilizer because it's going to another sector for use? Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and uh, and it does. So in that um, uh, you know proportion that's coming from the fertilizer manufacturer, when you're looking at the manufacturer of the fertilizer, a proportion of the emissions actually go with that CO2 that's being used for other purposes. So it's apportioned out, but it absolutely is included in the calculations. Yeah, um, and then the, there's another one which uh, is. Uh, from Simon Faulkner, which uh, again, any of the panelists are free to answer, which are, are we fully aware of the potential adverse impacts of long-term cover crops, i.e. increased wireworm, or I would say, you know, acting as a green bridge between sort of rotations. Um, so, Ali, is this something that um, yeah, you're sort of uh, aware of or um, support with members with? Um so there's never going to be a silver bullet when it comes to any of these sort of solutions and we do know that there's always public trade always trade-offs in terms of any benefit that you get there's always going to be downsides and you know cover crops are the same they're not the silver bullet to solve the solution of net zero and what the nfu is asking for is around various different other apps that we've got um, to support the sector in achieving net zero. I think increased R&D and especially, you know, close to market R&D to make sure that, you know, some of these solutions, we understand the impacts and we understand what sort of um, trade-offs that they might involve. Um, so, you know, in terms of the um, the various different work is that's going on. I think you know it needs to be a cross industry effort and supported by government, but that's something that we're really um, keen to support because we we're well aware that actually you know carbon isn't the only focus here as well. You know, there's a lots of other environmental benefits that we need to support at the same time. And farmers are so multifaceted, and it's about making sure that you know they can give holistic approach. You know, as Harry was saying earlier, a holistic care. I guess of the countryside while still supporting food production that we all need, especially with an ever increasing population. Thank you. And Harry, I was just going to ask: is you know, is that you know this issue around cover crops um, something that Chap have been looking into as well? Yeah, I mean, we look at um, disease sensing uh, in fields um, for for various um, pests and diseases, and um, and yeah, I mean, there are there are potentially um, technologies that could help, but I, I also want to think about the soil health here, um, you know, because it's actually the it's actually the, the full micro and, and macrobiome that's 
that's uh, changing you know when you begin to uh, basically leave uh, leave more uh, biomass uh, in situ for for a longer period of time be it by cover crops or lays or, or agroforestry systems and they they all the, they all uh, change the uh, the micro and microbiome and improve soil health over time and actually that begin in a lot of cases begins to build in the functional um, resilience of that soil and, and the resistance to um, to pests and disease threats and so what you might find is that actually you, your a lot of the pests and disease threats actually go down and then some of a, a very small proportion um, like wireworm for example may go up um, and uh, but your overall um, pest and disease problem um, might well go down and then it's more easy to administer targeted uh, targeted treatments for the, the smaller uh, number of uh, problems that you have that you have left so uh, I think it's also um, it's also very much a time thing because we know that soil health takes a while to improve and a lot of the, a lot of the studies point to you know sort of three or so years really to um, establish uh, an improvement in soil health from um, from a, a typical uh, arable baseline soil and I think um, we do need to give it some time we do need to give the soil some time um, and also be mindful of the fact that we're dealing with a different a different uh, substrate here to one that would be conventionally sort of treated in the conventional arable practice. Could I add to that as well? Yeah, certainly. So uh, Simon, one, I uh, want to commend you for the question actually. Um, so do we know all the long-term impacts? I think the short answer is no, okay? But we know quite a lot. And the wireworm question in particular, I, I think is you know, of real interest because it demonstrates that actually we need to be really conscious about what we're choosing to put in as the cover crop mix into our rotation, okay? So actually, you know, we can choose those species which will reduce the risk of wireworm transmission or transmission of any particular uh, uh, green bridge, as John puts it, for pests or disease. They can be managed, but I think we will continue to do work in this area we don't know everything yet but we do know a lot and we know a lot about the you know the overall balance being generally pretty beneficial thank you for that and john sorry i also thought i just <laughs> added not to come back around to me again um but i think the various different answers and responses that we've just gotten on this whole question just shows the benefit of all our organisations working together on this because we've got Harry's expertise, we've got Harley's expertise and we've got the NFU's lobbying expertise and I think as a bit of a partnership together we can take all this knowledge and we can actually highlight it to those people who decide on the policy and make the policy as to why things aren't you know they're not a single solution and things are a lot more nuanced and take a lot more time. Yeah, and, and almost to follow on from that um, uh, thought, we've, we, we've got a question, which are two questions from uh, David uh, Eglund and uh, Keris Jones, and I'm, I'm going to bang them together in, in a sort of somewhat messy way. But, you know, David's sort of asking very much about, you know, without carbon sequestration being sort of considered at a crop level, you know, surely the system is highly flawed. And, and Keris sort of, you know on the flip side of that says you know there's this focus on the, the the sort of greenhouse gas footprint of individual crops but how important or feasible is it for us to sort of look at the sort of total rotation or the entire farm business sort of issue um and i think you know if we, we consider those issues together you know how can we go about doing that so i'll start with harley uh, first and then go to the other panelists um Okay, thanks, John. Um, right, where to start? So, thinking about who wants this information, okay? Uh, let's start there. 
So I, I kind of find it useful when I'm uh, on farm and talk to people, you know, um, who wants to understand what about carbon? And at, whether it's at the crop level or at the farm level. Okay. Where, you know, the supply chains are going to continue to want to have the carbon footprints of an individual product, you know, um, ton of wheat, kilo of mi uh, meat, litre of milk, those sorts of things. And they want it to be comparable between different systems, different farms, uh, different sources. And the only way to really do that truly and fairly is to look at the emissions associated with production only and not the sequestration piece. Where uh, supply chains are interested in the farms that they are sourcing their products from, they're, more, they're, they're really quite interested in knowing the, about the, the sustainability of the farm as a, as a sort of total system, which brings in the sequestration piece, but it also brings in other things like habitat provision, you know, and um, uh, reduced diffuse pollution. More and more, policy is moving towards the farm level as well, the, the, the management of the farm as a unit, and it'll look at the, <clears throat> again, the carbon, uh, the habitat provision, the, the ecosystem services, and, and um, uh, what are the, the reduced diffuse pollution. So it's slightly different things at different scales for different audiences. But one of the big audience, you know, one of the big things for me in particular is actually how can we use the information about carbon to look at the efficiency of the business? So carbon can be used as, a, as just a, a different lens through which to view the, the business efficiency, okay? Because another question I get asked quite a lot is, is how much is it likely to cost me to reduce my carbon footprint of my sales production or my beef enterprise or, or, or one thing or other? And who's going to pay me for that, essentially? Fortunately, most of what you're likely to do to reduce your carbon footprint is also going to increase your profitability. So I rather like the idea of Focus on profitability, but be able to demonstrate the environmental co-benefits that come along with the increased profitability. So is that is that okay, John? That that sort of um, that was like you said, it's a bit of a messy question, and I've, I've wrapped quite it, a lot. It, it, it was it was a nasty question. Uh, but Ali and Harry, is there anything else that you sort of want to add to that sort of question? I was just going to say that yeah, I mean. Um, I agree with everything that Harley said, but I think also what we are seeing is the is the sort of market and the and some of the growers producers um, looking to exploit uh, emerging market opportunities here, and we may we may see that beginning to force a different approach um, down the line. That I can't uh, I can't sort of be, be definite on, but. You know, you see uh, growers like uh, Barsley England who are using uh, sort of more, much more regenerative uh, orchard cropping in order to uh, get the most sustainable uh, apple crop that they can do, and and hopefully sell uh, sell some surplus carbon uh, into an emerging carbon market. And then you see um, even potato um, processors like uh, Puffin Produce. I was reading about. Uh, last week uh, in in Wales, who uh, are producing, um, are aiming to produce uh, carbon neutral um, potato products. So there are people out there that are, you know, taking this on from um, from the bottom up and and looking to um, exploit a market nation that is that is emerging. And and we may see that translating through the supply chain and um, begin to get um, more of a more of a supply chain uh, forcing on on that as well so I think that's worth sort of noting here as well. Thank you and Ali where where do you think the commercial value is for farmers in measuring and uh, managing their, their carbon? Well I guess firstly what we what VNFU would like to say is that farmers 
own the benefits of the great work that they're doing and you know this is really important for us because they're doing this great work and it should you know it should be providing rewards back to them you know that it should be within their control and um, i think in terms of like commercial value this is something which is um I've worked on both across like the combinable crops aspects, but also the horticultural um, crops aspects. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for increasing commercial and business aspects alongside reducing footprints. And I think this ties in really well with our first pillar of um, our sort of net roadmap to net zero within the NFU, which is around productivity. Uh, and there's a strong correlation of improving product uh, productivity and reducing carbon footprint uh, and you know we know that um, every business is different and every business um, will have a different starting point and approach to achieving net zero uh, and that there will be other aspects that uh, we need to look at such as carbon sequestration in the soil but I think there's a really strong parallel here and I think this is something where we can get some really good options for win-win solutions uh, and especially when it's looking at inputs and like Harley mentioned, I think it was in the presentation itself, about variable rates and such and minimising or tailoring inputs, sorry, to the crop. You know, it's not about necessarily reducing use, but it's making sure that we get the precise amount needed there so that everything is utilised. Thank you. And uh, sort of following on from that, um, uh, Ali, um, Eric An Anderson asks a really good question about you know, current rules for good husbandry do not allow soil organic matter to be part of the tenants improvement plan. And, and I would add to that, <clears throat> you know, farms are leasing land and maybe they've entered into one of the new sustainable farming incentive agreements and they've got certain sort of actions that they've uh, sort of um, signed up to. How do we make sure that, you know, those leases recognize maybe the improvements that a tenants put in or maybe, you know, the, the status of land at the beginning of a lease that you know maybe the tenant needs to be wary of so that the the owner isn't sort of penalized now how is nfu working in this this space yeah so i mean when it comes to tenancies it's such a complex issue and i think there's always various different types of tenancies and various different agreements which are going on between landlord and tenant and um, the nfu has its own tenants forum and um, because you know a lot of our members are tenants a lot of them have tenanted farms uh, and they understand the restrictions uh, and the opportunities that come along with it um, I think in terms of good agricultural practice and good practice to reduce your carbon footprint, um, I think this is where we need to make sure that policy and support programmes such as ELM and SFI, I'm sorry, Sustainable Farming Incentive and uh, Environmental Land Management, I need to stop using acronyms, um, that they reward farmers and tenants for doing the good work. We coming back to my previous comment is that actually we need to make sure that the value of the good work that farmers are doing lands in the farmers' laps. You know, you know, it goes back straight to them because those are the people who are providing them. Um, you know, it's, again, there's no silver bullet solution to any of this, but it's making sure that um policymakers and across the industry we're all working together and we're including tenants and enabling them to access these support schemes and various other opportunities to help us all work towards net zero. No, I, I agree. It's, you know, it is, it is a complicated area, but it's, it, you know, these are the sort of nuts and bolts sort of issues that will really uh, either support or undermine the industry. So talking about support, you know, very much uh, uh, the purpose of the net zero report is to give you know a really robust baseline for you know UK uh, cropping and Eric Anderson asks a question you know given the carbon footprint of soya are vegans exporting their environmental obligations and should more of this be made in terms of UK food security I'm going to answer that one and say absolutely yes we need to make sure that we look at the total environmental footprint as our panelists have all said and you know uh, we need to make sure that we look at both direct uh, carbon impacts uh, from land use uh, and growing that particular crop, as well as indirect land use where maybe you know uh, rainforest has been chopped down to grow uh, soya production. I think there are concerns as well in the mind of the public about you know can there ever be sustainable soya, and therefore there is an opportunity for us here in the UK to grow those alternative 
uh, crops, uh, but it's being able to do so at a scale uh, and uh, level that is uh, sort of economically uh, viable. So great question there. Um, just to come in a little bit further on that, I just wanted to add to that. It's, it's also um, other metrics that we have to consider. There's some really great um, UK work that's come out of uh, Cranfield University, I believe, that's looking at the embodied droughts within uh, the global supply chain. So it's not only the embodied carbon within the, the global supply chain, but it's also the embodied drought within that global supply chain. We, we are uh, exploiting a lot of um, semi-arid areas to, to grow crops in that um, won't necessarily be able to take that um, for forever and a day. So um, we do need to be mindful of the, of the global implications of, uh, of our food system. Uh, exactly. Just, sorry to also come in there, John. You know, I think one of the, well, a couple of the main principles for the NFU around the whole of net zero is that actually the UK has a moral obligation to keep producing food because we've got such a, a strong climate, um, maritime climate to be able to produce food. And, and you know, we're not a water scarce um, country like Harry mentioned. And you know, we've got some prime conditions to produce some of the world's best food. So for us, you know, it's about making sure that food production isn't undermined by looking towards net zero and that, you know, food production goes hand in hand with reducing our footprint, but also not exporting our footprint. And, you know, that comment around soil is really important because actually, you know, there's no, there's no point in reducing our footprint just to, you know, export it somewhere else, uh, you know, to, sorry, import our food from somewhere else and export that footprint. You know, it, it, this is a cross world um, uh, issue and we all need to be working on a holistic level, not just sort of being siloed in our thinking. And that's something that we continue to stress with government because, you know, that's something which is integral. We can't just be undermined by um, putting our footprint somewhere else and uh, letting another country who might be less equipped to deal with the impacts to deal with them. So, you know, that's something that is really integral for us. And it's it's really important and, it, it, you know, it's good to see that actually in the 25-year environment plan, that's absolutely explicit. The UK should not be um, exporting its, uh, its carbon emissions or other environmental impacts. Now we just need to make sure that that actually happens. I agree. I, I think, uh, you know, we, we need to look at these uh, wider sustainability issues and, and we just can't do things in uh, isolation. So uh, a sort of question that uh, sort of links to sort of maybe future resilience. Uh, Jeremy Wiltshire has asked, you know, do your scenarios for decreasing emissions assume constant yield? And if not, what are the greenhouse implications of decreased production uh, leading to, you know, increased production elsewhere? Uh, or, or, you know, are we assuming that, you know, maybe we have to sort of change the way we crop? And, and, I, and I suppose we've got that background of climate change is not just something that happens in other countries. It's going to have a significant impact here in the UK and, and make curtail our ability to grow certain crops. Shall I, um, shall I take that? Uh, yeah. Okay, so one, great to um, uh, hear from you, Jeremy. Um, the assumption is that the UK maintains current levels of production. Okay, so um, it's not, uh, we're not looking at any scenarios where we save carbon at the expense of production. But that's not to say, and I think you'll recognise, that we can make efficiencies within the systems that we've got for production okay so production stays level carbon comes down thank you uh, harley another question for you um and we've got several people asking this um that you know the levy for hdb is uh raised across you know not just england so <laughs> will the uh report embrace uh emissions uh across you know uh other sectors, uh, other countries, and devolved administrations, in particular Scotland and Northern Ireland. Absolutely, the the the, the uh, title of the report is absolutely deliberate. It is net zero and UK cropping review. Okay, so we're not just looking at England; we are looking at, uh, across um, all the devolved. Um, uh, I will say it is limited by what work has been done 
but we have got um, information on uh, a lot of the crops, not all the crops, um, from across all the devolves. So, for example, for the arable crops, that is um, all four quarters of the UK, for sure. Thank you. And we've got one question which uh, might be quite controversial, but I, I think it's um, uh, worth asking. And I, I'll start with uh, uh, Ali. Uh, and this question comes from uh, Anne Noble. What are the panel's thoughts on solar farms, which are taking thousands of acres of land out of production and replacing food production by native grass, which may be grazed, although in you know many cases it might be just mown and clipped? Um, uh, and uh, you know, remove from that land, therefore, sort of uh, denuding the nutrient status of the soil, um, and you know, switching production away from UK potentially to, you know, uh, overseas. Um, yeah, thanks, John. Um, so I think in terms of so uh, renewable energy itself, you know, we're always a strong advocate that you know where it fits with business models where it fits with business opportunities and farmers opportunities you know that farmers should have the opportunity to look towards renewable energy and um to be able to create uh, energy in a more green way but you know when it comes to food production we've always been clear that you know food production levels shouldn't be impacted by net zero you know we want to maintain production levels and <laughs> It's about making sure that we have sort of a, a land sharing aspect in all sense of the term um, and making sure that we have farmers are able to embrace opportunities that come along, where, you know, whether that's solar farms, wind turbines and such, or sorry, solar panels or wind turbines and such. But it's making sure that, you know, they're able to continue doing the role that they that they provide, which is providing food for a nation. Um, but, you know, ultimately, it's about making sure that the farmer has the opportunity to make a, a business decision for what you, what they think is right for their farm. Thank you. And if I can just um, sort of come on uh, I'm in on that one as well. I think it's it's broadly about um, it's broadly about easy versus difficult decisions, isn't it, as well? I think um, you know it's very easy to build uh, to build houses on greenfield land. It's, it's very easy to um, build a solar farm on on a flat field. But there are there are technological solutions out there. We can we can raft uh, solar panels uh, on top of um, natural flood management reservoirs. Um, we can put them on buildings, obviously, um, and we should be putting them where the um where the soil is really not conducive for uh, production or for carbon um storage uh, some of the some of the soils by proxy of their depth or their mineralogy um have quite a low um organic carbon uh, drawdown potential and um they may be they may be more difficult though to to implement uh, a solar farm on they might be a bit a bit uh, hillier um, for example but um technologies do exist um to make this work and i think it's really important because what we're we're getting to a crescendo not only around the solar farms but also around um you know bioenergy and and other land use pressures wherein um we're going to have to start making more strategic decisions at landscape scale, at catchment scale, and just say, okay, we need flood storage reservoirs here, we need bioenergy crops there, and um, it's going to, we're going to need to make some more difficult decisions and not necessarily just say, okay, I've got a nice uh, flat field here um, that's quite uh, close. To um, to some existing services, uh, I can I can implement a solar farm quite easily. Thank you for that. Right, we're at, um, pretty John, much out sorry. of time. Oh, sorry. Um, I, <laughs> sorry, not to put in there. And I think um, uh, just going back to the point around the solar panels as well. Um, I think looking at the horticultural sector as well. The um, I think there's some really good opportunities to tie in um, both solar panel 
uh, and renewable energy production alongside food production. And I know that Harry mentioned around um, you know, the use of solar panels on buildings and in um, less utilised areas of the farm. And I think there's a lot of farmers who are already doing that. And I think it's about looking about what's out there and showing that actually you know, food production doesn't need to be compromised, but actually can be enhanced by some of these technologies. Um, so I think that's a really important point. I'd agree with that. And, you know, just for uh, the audience, there is actually a consultation. Well, it's a call for evidence out with Bayes at the moment looking at CHP energy. That will be particularly uh, applicable to, you know, the horticulture industry, protected hort, where they've maybe got CHP. So, you know, uh, I'd encourage you to sort of look for that. If you can't find it, then email me at john.foot at ahdb.org.uk and I'll send you the link and you can sort of respond to that. Thank you to everybody for the questions. We are out of time. What we will do is we will go through those questions and feed them back uh, to uh, uh, everybody. And we will make this webinar available, uh, as I said, after the event, and there'll be a link and it'll be there uh, for uh, everybody to come back to. We will have a follow-up event in the new year when we launch the full report. And also the questions that you've got and the feedback that we've got in the questions at the moment are really good. And we will use those as we write the final report, because actually there are some very good points in there that we need to, to sort of recognize and, and build in at this stage. So I'd like to thank everybody, uh, in particular, Harley, uh, Ali and Harry today for uh, uh, presenting and being the panelists. I'd also like to uh, thank Amanda Tomlinson, who is in the background making sure the webinar works along with our events team. We, we often forget the uh, sort of uh, team there. Uh, and uh, you should all receive uh, a link to the video it, uh, within the next 24 hours. So thank you very much to you all for joining us today. And uh, uh, we look forward to speaking to you in the new year. Thank you.